Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Jack Markowski. I'm uh, chairman of the NAL Board of Directors. And welcome to uh, today's NAL uh, Planning and Policy Conference. The theme is uh, CRA begins at 40, where we're going to have an opportunity today to reflect on 40 years' experience with CRA and look forward, see what we've done in the past, what we can learn from the past, and look forward to how we can adapt to the uh, changing environment today and into the future. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I've been asked to ask everybody to turn off your cell phones, turn cell phones off. And I've also been asked to uh, ask people not to stand in front of the camera. <laughs> to begin today, it's most fitting for us to, have, to hear from the nation's foremost housing official, Department of Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson. Secretary Carson is the 17th HUD Secretary. Uh, as HUD Secretary, this is, he's the foremost housing official in the country, uh, overseeing the Federal Housing Administration, public housing, CDBG, home, Section 8, all forms of rental assistance. So he is the foremost uh, public official dealing with what we all here care about, which is affordable housing and community development. Before coming to HUD, Dr. Carson was the, uh, the youngest ever director of pediatric neurosurgery at the John Hopkins Children's Center, where he served for 30 years. He was also, he's also been co-founder of the Carson Scholars Fund. The Scholars Fund rec recognizes young people of all backgrounds for exceptional academic and humanitarian accomplishments. You know that he's received many uh, awards, very prestigious awards, but two among them that I would like to note is the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the, and the Spingarn Medal which is the highest honor bestowed by the NAACP. In his capacity as HUD secretary, Dr. Carson has emphasized the importance of public-private partnerships within the housing industry. Within NAL is a cross-sector network of, with members representing the private sector and public sector. We know very well the importance of public-private partnerships and this is right at the heart of everything that we care about and that we talk about in our meetings. Our mission of NAL, in fact, is to expand economic opportunity through responsible private financing for affordable housing and inclusive neighborhood revitalization. Secretary Carson has also expressed support for the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, a resource that all of you in this room, I would venture to say, appreciate and know how to use as a significant source of capital for affordable housing developments. Tax credits are a very good example of what effective and efficient public-private partnerships can look like, and we appreciate Secretary Carson's ongoing support for this program. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you HUD Secretary Ben Carson. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction and to the National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders for your gracious invitation to be here today and for, and for what you do for the American people, uh, help so many people realize the American dream. Uh, before I delve into other topics, I'd let's just like to draw your attention, thoughts, and prayers to our many fellow Americans who we're devastated by the recent uh, hurricanes and wildfires. But the encouraging thing is that, you know, they show so much resilience. And uh, resilience has, in the past, been one of the real characteristics of America. You know, in the face of all the devastation and loss of life, our countrymen in the Gulf states, California, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, you know, have really come to the fore, but what has really been encouraging is watching what other people have done, how other people have stepped up and have helped when they themselves weren't necessarily primarily affected. I remember going down to Houston, and uh, as I approached the convention center, I saw all these signs that says, we're not accepting any more donations. 
And I said, what? How can that possibly be? But when I got into the convention center, I fully understood. I mean, there were mountains of bottled water, food, clothes, boots, anything that you could possibly imagine. And it's stacked all the way to the roof, all the way to the ceiling. And you know, that's what, that's what we have done uh, in the past. You know, we have been very neighborly, very compassionate. I think it's one of the reasons that our country flourished so well. Uh, you know, early on, there were communities that would be separated from other communities by dozens and sometimes hundreds of miles. And yet, they not only thrived, but they grew. Why? Because people cared about each other. You know, if it was harvest time and, you know, somebody got injured, fell out of a tree, broke his leg, all the other neighbors pitched in. Somebody got killed by a bear, everybody else took care of their family. I mean, it was, it was the way that we were. And uh, I think there, there are many that are still like that in this country. You know, on a policy level, uh, at HUD we're providing special mortgage relief through the FHA. And uh, HUD has granted a 90-day moratorium on foreclosures. And uh, we're going to extend those uh, protections through the holidays and beyond, recognizing what people are going through and offering loan forbearance and modifications for those borrowers who are struggling to make their payments in the uh, affected areas. And to ensure that we don't shut off viable home ownership uh, opportunities in these areas, HUD has moved quickly to restore FHA lending in Florida uh, by uh, granting waivers for certain inspections. And, uh, you know, we're really looking at ways of making that a more permanent thing. You know, there are so many rules and regulations that preclude rapid and efficient dissemination of funds and aid to people. And it largely stems from the fact that over the course of many decades, layering of regulations has created a labyrinth. Instead of a straight line from point A to point B, it's a labyrinth. Uh, and it's not because there have been bad people there, but it's because they say, this is an even better regulation than the other one. And instead of replacing it, they just add it on. And the book becomes so thick, and uh, it becomes confusing even for the professionals uh, on how to deal with these things. So uh, that's become a major concern for us, and I think you'll be seeing a lot of improvement. Um, and we've also made available specific mortgage uh, products, you know, for homeowners whose property were destroyed through Section 203H. You know, they can have up to 100% uh, financing and uh, for rehabilitation or for moving if they want to. And uh, through 203K, you know, we can completely refinance uh, their mortgage and include repairs uh, in that uh, low interest program. So those are the kinds of things that are making a difference. Uh, we're making other arrangements as part of our larger recovery efforts, including the coordination of disaster relief funding. And uh, just c keep paying attention to that because you will see a much smoother transition from FEMA uh, to HUD than we've seen in the past. I'm extremely grateful for the work of my team, the other federal agencies, uh, those at the state level, those at the local level, uh, the private institutions, all have been absolutely invaluable. Uh, in in terms of helping us to move forward. Now, I'm certain that uh, many people here in this room uh, have joined in the effort in some way. Uh, you guys are on the front line when it comes to Bowers, and many of your, your uh, firms are working 
with affected Americans right now, helping them to get back on their feet through your forbearance modifications. Um, now, this is hard work, and we do recognize that. Um, but, you know, this is a crucial time for people to roll up their sleeves and really get involved. We want to give our fellow hurting Americans a reason to be joyful once again. Now, it's often said that owning a home is at the heart of the American dream. It is the primary mechanism for wealth building in this country. The average homeowner has a net worth of over $200,000. Average renter has a net worth of about $5,000. And you know, that was one of the reasons that there was such a push 10 years ago to get people into home ownership. But it was done irresponsibly. And uh, you know, to put somebody into a home they can't afford is not really doing them a favor. You know, they lose the home, they lose their credit, they lose their future opportunities. It's really quite a cruel thing to do. Uh, we obviously must learn from those things and make sure that we don't repeat that kind of mistake in the past. And uh, you all, who help so many people, you know, achieve the dream of home ownership, are an indispensable part of the American dream. And uh, you know, that's another place where your mission and our interest at HUD intersect. Now, many past thinkers and politicians in this country, you know, saw the uh, activities of industry and finance and how they could affect the lives of their countrymen. <coughs> they saw the intersection of, tri of private interest and the common good and had very different thoughts about that relationship. For instance, some thought that commerce had to be subject to government, managed and controlled, because government was the only entity with a moral compass and the ability to improve lives. Well, now the people who thought that way, they weren't, they're not evil people. They just had a different philosophy than the founders of our nation. The ideal of private enterprise versus public welfare has always been a false choice. This administration does not consider private business as a rival to the government or somehow opposed to the best interests of the American people. Instead, private business is the activity of the American people exercising their right to a free economy. And the government's job is to protect that freedom. Therefore, when pursuing HUD's mission to ensure safe, affordable, inclusive housing for our countrymen, we cannot expect to achieve it by hindering the dream makers, from bankers to builders. We only hurt our own goals by making it harder for responsible loans to occur, harder to build affordable housing, harder to manufacture safe materials. In a country where it's easier to own a home, start a business, hire employees, get a job, that's the country we want. And we do that by working together while Americans themselves take the lead and not being manipulated into thinking that we're enemies. As you've seen recently, a tremendous amount of effort to divide people, uh, to create strife on the basis of any identifying feature. And that's not what America is. That's not why we're called the United States of America. And it's only going to be through the resistance of those efforts that we will be successful, not only in the area of achieving the American dream, but in the area of advancing the civilization. Across the nation, I've seen the successes of public-private partnerships, churches, fraternal organizations, and businesses, 
And uh, all of this leads to the general welfare of the community. You know, earlier this week I was in Atlanta and I was looking at a, a very well uh, organized community development. This had been in an area of the city that had been a disaster. Uh, a lot of crime, tremendous poverty. But through public-private partnerships, they're able to build a community that is gorgeous. Anybody would love to live there. And uh, it was a complete community with all supportive services, including schools. And the schools traditionally in that area were ranked at the bottom in achievement in the state. And now they're at the top, 99th percentile. Uh, this is what can be done in our neighborhoods when we work together. You know, the old model was HUD and the federal government would ride in on a white horse with a bucket of money, say, build this multifamily place for these people and head off to the next project. And uh, you saw what the result of that was. But uh, when we work across silos and we develop complete communities with all the needs that are there to nurture people and to develop people, uh, this that I just described is an example of what we're able to do. These alliances for prosperity work best when HUD and other branches of the government facilitate cooperation, don't run roughshod over private initiatives. That's why low-income housing tax credit is one of our best resources for creating more affordable houses in the United States. For 30 years, it has given states and localities almost eight billion dollars annually in budget authority to issue tax credits to people and businesses who want to build, maintain, and purchase low-income housing. And, you know, I think it's time to really start thinking about increasing that program. It's a great incentive to let Americans keep more of their own money, and it encourages them to invest in the future of their fellow Americans. And I think a wise government knows how to create win-win situations for everybody, not pitting one group against another, not favoring one group over another, but really creating fairness. And I think that's, that's all American business needs to be able to thrive. There's also the goal of our rental assistance demonstration, RAD program, which gives public housing authorities the ability to reinvest in public housing stock. And, uh, you know, one of the, the key things there is there's a lot of delayed maintenance issues, about $26 billion worth, and the RAT program helps to eradicate those very quickly. Uh, the program has leveraged over $4 billion in private and public funds since it began, stimulated an estimated 75,000 new jobs. And it would have taken public housing authorities approximately 46 years to raise the capital funds to uh, complete a similar level of construction and rehabilitation. So you see, doing it the old way would never get us where we need to be. And then we have our new Envision Centers. Some of you have probably heard about those. Um, you know, this is, it actually comes from the Bible. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, without a vision, the people perish. So at first we call them vision centers, but we figured people would think they were getting glasses. So, uh, <laughs> so we changed it to Envision Centers. And, um, the best way to describe it is, you know, you go into a low opportunity area and you ask a kid, what do you want to do when you grow up? And in many cases, you get a blank stare. Sometimes you get one or two traditional things, maybe sometimes even three, four, or five. But there's a thousand. And the Envision Centers are to expose them to the other 995. 
and what you need to do to prepare to get there and to help people along the way. And they also serve as a center for mentorship programs because there are a lot of great mentors. A lot of people in this room could be great mentors, but they don't have a good mechanism uh, to do that. And uh, many studies have shown that uh, low opportunity children who are mentored graduate from high school at a much higher rate than those who are not. Also serve as a center to help people uh, take advantage of child care programs, good child care programs. Because so many uh, young women in disadvantaged areas have babies early on, and that usually ends their educational pursuits, and they become dependent. We want them to be able to get their GED, their associate's degree, their bachelor's, their master's, be able to take care of themselves. More importantly, to teach that to their children and to break the cycles of dependency that have been mounting over the last half a century. We have the ability to change that. And in this spirit, you know, President Trump directed federal agencies to guard against burdening American families and their businesses with unnecessary regulation and control. In keeping with this executive order, we have established a regulatory reform committee uh, at HUD charged with identifying agency regulations that should be repealed, replaced, or modified. And I'm sure if you've been working with HUD for a long time, you have a good idea of what some of those things are. Uh, one of the most important principles in running HUD is to balance the fulfillment of our mission with protecting the taxpayers. Fulfilling our mission requires us to ensure that creditworthy borrowers have access to robust mortgage credit. Without lenders like yourselves willing to offer FHA-assisted loans or serve as Ginnie Mae issuers, the path to affordable credit access is undermined, particularly for lower income people. And we have heard the concerns on the part of some in the lending community about participating fully in our programs because they are weary of undue risk from lack of clarity in what we expect and exposure to outsized liability from immaterial errors. Lenders have rightly pointed out that absolute perfection in the lending process cannot be achieved, and that borrowers bear the cost of compliance through higher mortgage rates. Other sectors of the market have made real progress in addressing these issues and creating more confidence to lend. Now, we have heard these concerns, and we've recently announced in consultation with the Justice Department that uh, HUD is committed to reviewing and uh, addressing these concerns. You know, pursuing uh, reasonable people with false claims acts and other overbearing regulations does not create the right environment for healthy growth of public-private partnerships or business in general. Part of the process will entail a review by FHH, FHA of its lender certifications and the implementation of defect taxometry. This review will benefit greatly from the extensive feedback that we receive from lenders and other stakeholders in our request to put regulatory reform in the right perspective. And your feedback has been and will continue to be invaluable to us. HUD's objective from this effort is simple. We want every good lender who makes responsible loans and services them to feel confident that they can participate fully 
and HUD's program, serving borrowers and enabling housing to continue to spur our economy. But before leaving this subject, there should be no lack of clarity about one point. And there's no room at the FHA or Ginny May for bad actors. You know, we're not open to business with frost, fraudsters and those who operate without proper controls, those who don't take their obligations in our market seriously. And they will be found out and held accountable. We must do this to protect our taxpayers, their hard-earned dollars, and the fiscal integrity of FHA and Ginny May. For example, Ginny May, in partnership with the Veterans Administration, has created a task force to ensure that our veterans are not exposed to abu abusive practices like churning, refinancing, of Veterans Administration loans should obviously truly benefit our veterans. In addition, I've recently told members of the Housing Finance Services uh, Committee that I share great personal interest with this administration in tackling housing finance reform. You know, we're entering the 10th year of conservatorship for Freddie and Fannie. And that's far too long for this issue to remain unresolved. Moving forward, HUD will be an active participant in this critical dialogue because our fundamental housing mission and FHA mortgage insurance program and Ginny Mae mortgage-backed security guarantee are large and vital components of the housing finance system. In fact, you know, when you look at the mortgage business between FHA and Jenny, you're talking over three trillion, with a T, dollars. And next year, Jenny May will celebrate 50 years of successfully providing federal guarantees on mortgage-backed securities. That level of experience obviously is going to be invaluable in the whole housing finance reform uh, discussion. And uh, the details of the housing finance reform are currently being written. And uh, that writing will be enhanced when we finally get an FHA commissioner and a Ginny Mae president. Some politics involved there, but it is coming. And, uh, we're not letting that stop us, the fact that uh, we don't have those people. You know, we've gone for long periods of time without critical positions. But the wonderful thing that you should know is that a lot of career people have stepped up to the plate and really helped keep the ball moving forward. So, you know, hopefully some of the people who are traditional politicians in the swamp will uh, begin to realize that we shouldn't be playing politics with issues that affect the entirety of the American population. <laughs> it affects Democrats, Republicans, independents, everybody else. And we need at some point to just stop playing politics and start using our collective abilities to actually solve the problems that affect all of us. A lot of the federal government needs to be updated to increase the efficiency with the vast array of new technologies that have come on the scene. HUD is no exception. Our administration wants to modernize FHA, bringing its systems into the 21st century. Now there is some advantage to having these old mainframe systems. Nobody can hack them because they don't know how to do it. But, uh, but this will enable us to, to serve our beneficiaries, protect taxpayers, and achieve our mission quickly and sustainably. Now, since these improvements will surely benefit lenders, 
that use FHA. I look forward to your support and cooperation as we make these vital investments for our future common good. As we work together toward reform, I ask for your continued good counsel and commitment to meeting the housing needs of American families. That commitment is why I came to HUD, and I'm sure that's why you're here today. You know, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I spent many, many hours sometimes operating all night trying to give kids a second chance at life, only to have to send them back, in many cases, to horrible living environments. And sometimes I could see the sadness on their face when it was time for them to be discharged. And I would even order extra tests so they could stay in the hospital extra day. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but, uh, you know, now I have an opportunity to actually do something about that environment. We all have an opportunity to do something about it and to do it efficiently, effectively, using data using evidence. It's not just a matter of how much money you throw at a problem. It's a matter of, of how much intellect you're willing to invest and how much analysis you're willing to do in terms of information that is already available to us. I believe that many of you are here today because you feel the same way. We desire to live in a nation where all have a path to self-sufficiency, where all may buy, build, and sell houses. No one is left without shelter. It is in the private interest. It is in the public interest. And it can be our mission, freely chosen and freely shared. I often have spoken of the great day when no family in our nation will want for housing. Every child will be warm, healthy, and safe. But as America marches toward that goal, and it does seem ever closer to being within our reach, perhaps we could be forgiven a small vanity and allow ourselves to wonder what future generations will write about us in their history book. What will they say about the beginning of the end of homelessness? It's within our grasp. 15 years ago, we had 800,000 homeless people. Now we have 550,000. We've reduced homelessness among veterans by 47%. Community after the community is announcing victory on homelessness. What will they say about us and homelessness? of an era when more and more Americans could responsibly afford homes, of a time when independence and prosperity replaced generational poverty. I know they will say that it was a time of cooperation, a time of good government, a time of free enterprise, a time of great charity and rejection of hatred and division. I hope they will say that it was our time. Thank you and God bless America. <laughs>